If you have the opportunity to travel in West Africa in places like Senegal and Burkina Faso, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, you might see images of this man uh, painted on, this, on in graffiti, on, in decals in the back of cars, and clothes that people wear. This is Thomas Sankara. He was president of Burkina Faso for about three years from uh, uh, in, in the early 80s. And uh, he was a very inspirational leader for many. He remains an inspirational figure for many today, uh, sometimes called the Che Guevara of, uh, of Africa. Uh, and so like Che Guevara, you'll see uh, images of him uh, painted everywhere in order to uh, inspire people to act in a, in, a, in a political way to transform the continent in more positive directions. Uh, this is a lecture for people who uh, have not really heard of Sankara before and who would be curious to learn more about him and about why he was so important and why he remains such an important figure. And, and we're going to look at some of his political ideas, which were uh, very much influenced by the thought of Franz Fanon. He's been called uh, the... Uh, the Fanon of politics in the sense that, of African politics, in the sense that whereas Fanon uh, uh, developed the theory in his Wretched of the Earth and elsewhere, uh, Fanon theorized the revolution, although Fanon died, you know, early. And so as a consequence, um, by, by early, I mean in the early 60s, and when he was still a very relatively young man, he died of leukemia. And so he didn't really, you know, he theorized what would happen, but he himself uh, did not uh, live through the period of decolonization. He was just at the very beginning of that period. Uh, Sankara is uh, arguably is Fanonist in his thinking, influenced by Fanon, but he is Fanon in practice. You know, Sankara implemented the ideas of Fanon in a very practical way in a very particular context, the context of uh, the former French Upper Volta, which later came, uh, he, he changed the name of the country to, uh, to Burkina Faso. And uh, he was murdered. Uh, he was assassinated as, as often happens uh, in, uh, in, in Africa, unfortunately, when uh, somebody defies the wills of, of the colonial powers. And, uh, his life was tragically cut short. He was a very young man. He showed so much uh, political promise, and he did so much to transform uh, Burkina Faso that I, I'd like to take a little time and, and review some of these things that he did, and what, what some of his ideas were and some of his policies were. Now, I lived myself in Burkina Faso from 1996 to 1997. Um, I was there in the period after he had been assassinated and at, the, at a time when Norbert Zongo, who was also assassinated, uh, uh, was still alive. And so I had an opportunity to experience Burkina Faso and to see myself uh, what, uh, what the situation was there and what the people uh, in Burkina Faso thought of Thomas Sankar. And so I'd like to also share some of those insights with you as well. And I, I will tell you, frankly, Sankar is a man whom uh, I've, I've admired for, for many years. Uh, so we'll, we'll take a little time and go through some of Sankara's uh, contributions. Now you can see here he lived from uh, 1949 to 1987. Uh, he, he was president of Burkina Faso from 1983 to 1987 uh, before he was killed in, in a coup d'etat. Now, uh, he was born in, uh, in Yako, Upper Volta, in Burkina Faso, which is more or less in the central area of Burkina Faso, but then he moved to the, to the southern part at, a, at a, quite a young age where he grew up. Now, uh, Thomas Sankara, in terms of his ethnicity, he was uh, a, a Masi, but he was also a Pol. He was, he was what's called a, a Silmi Masi, and this is a, and it's interesting in terms of how this uh, mixed ethnic identity affected him uh, personally and his political views as well, because the, the, the Burkina Bay are by and large, uh, you know, the, the, historically they've had a very large uh, 
concentration of the Masi people in uh, in Ouagadougou area. That's this is where the Masi Empire was, the Masi Kingdom, and uh, and and there's also, however, quite a few Fulani that live in uh, in Burkina Faso, and this ethnic group that he belonged to was essentially a kind of a sub-ethnic group and even an ethnic group that, you know, arguably we could say experienced some uh, discrimination because it was a, a prohibited uh, um, group in, in the sense that, you know, Masi and Po weren't, you know, often encouraged to marry one another. And so this, this was a group that developed of people who were both Masi and Po. And so he belonged to this group. And in fact, even the word itself, Burkina Faso, is a combination of a Masi word and a, uh, and, and a Pular word or a Fafulde word. And so he, uh, e even the name of the country bears that, uh, that same kind or replicates that same kind of uh, combination of, of ethnic uh, groups uh, and their identity that he, he belonged to. And this is also significant as well because, you know, he did in his life experience some discrimination as a person who belonged to this sub-ethnic uh, group from those who were not, uh, you know, who had historically looked upon the uh, Silmi Masi as, as an inferior uh, group of people. Uh, and he was a spokesman for, uh, for the poor of the poor, for what Fanon would call uh, the wretched of earth and the wretched of the earth, the people. So in this case, he had this sort of double uh, legacy of, of belonging to a people who were extremely impoverished. Uh, and yet at the same time, even within his own country, he had this uh, legacy of being discriminated against. Uh, so we're talking really about the poor, the poor. Now, Burkina Faso, along with Mali and Niger for many years have been three of the poorest countries on, on earth, uh, you know, the poverty is just, uh, you know, unimaginable in terms of uh, what Western standards are. So people who come to this area from, say, the, the United States, uh, from, you know, Europe are often that, you know, you, ha you have to adjust yourself to, to this very different reality. I think when I lived there, the, uh, the gross national product or the average yearly income of, of an individual there was it was it was under three hundred dollars. I mean, imagine trying to live for a year on three hundred dollars so so we're talking about you know these these the burkina bay are very wonderful people uh and a very kind and hospitable people but but very poor so it's a very poor uh part of the world and part of the reason for this is it's quite inhospitable in terms of the uh the natural environment tatinga passere speaks of the you know the homicidal sun that that bears down uh, uh, upon you when you're there, and, and and then you have, of course, the Sahara problem, problems of desertification. So this is an area that's quite hostile to human uh, survival, and yet the uh, the the Burkina Bay people have have lived there for 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 many hundreds and hundreds of years, and have uh, this is this is their home. Uh, and so um, Sankara. Now, now, what in the uh, what we'll look at here, now I'm, I'm, I have two lectures that I'm going to be presenting on Sankara. The first one uh, will we'll work with uh, his political orientation speech because here, this is where, in this particular speech, Sankara lays out the main, uh, you know, principles of his ideology. So we'll take a look at that and see what, you know, Sankara's, you know, vision of, of the conflict was that existed in Burkina Faso and uh and and uh you know in the fight against colonization because again you know, as i said burkina faso is a very poor uh country but it was it's not it wasn't just a poor country because it was uh you know has this harsh hostile living conditions living environment it was also poor because it was colonized by the french who uh you know exploited the country for many years and, uh, and, and, and as Fanon will uh, observe, systematically underdeveloped the country. And so he was facing a legacy of not only a great impoverishment, but, but a legacy of, uh, of, of systematic uh, underdevelopment and exploitation and, and colonization. Now, uh, in his political orientation speech, which we'll look at, I'll also uh, uh, to quote a few, we'll, we'll take also a look at a few passages from Franz Fanon, and we'll see how the thought of Sankara, uh, you know, echoes that of Fanon, and we'll see how Fanon influenced Sankara as well. Uh, 
Um, I'm, I'm drawing from Samantha Anderson's, uh, she was the editor and translator of Thomas Sankara Speaks, the Burkino Faso Revolution 1983 through 1987, which was published in 1988. Now this remains, the, in my view, the single best source of information on Sankara. It's, it's a compilation of, of speeches that he gave, and so you get to hear him in his own words on many different occasions where he, uh, where he speaks to the people of Burkina Faso or say, for instance, to the people of Harlem in New York when he went to visit the United Nations. He stopped first in Harlem. Uh, all, also, uh, his, his United Nations speech and other, other prominent occasional speeches as well. So this, this is a wonderful resource and uh, we'll, we'll be drawing from it in, our, in this lecture and in the second lecture on Thomas Sankara's speeches. Uh, another, uh, other good sources are uh, Ernest uh, Harsh uh, did a book on Thomas Sankara, which was published in 2014. It's a short little book, uh, but it, it's, it's very concise, but it gives you all the, the essential facts about Sankara. Uh, Harsh has been a scholar of Burkina Faso for more than 30 years. He interviewed Sankara. He knew him, so he's, he's, a, he's a good source to go to for more information about Burkina Faso. Uh, not long ago, he published a book on Burkina Faso in 2017, and I've read this book just very recently. It's, it's a fine uh, study that gives you um, a view, uh, an overview of the history of what's taken place since the, day, the early days of the Burkina Bay Revolution up until about 2014 and 15 when uh, uh, Blaise Kempore who was the person who killed Thomas Sankara in a coup, was, or led the coup that killed him. He didn't actually pull the trigger. He claimed he was uh, at home, sick, in bed, uh, conveniently. Uh, but uh, the, he recently fled uh, after almost you know, 25, 30 years of, of rule as an, auto, as, as an autocratic dictator after killing Sankara. He, uh, the, the people of, of Burkina Faso uh, finally forced him to flee the country. Of course, the French protected him, uh, as they always did. And then he uh, went to Cote d'Ivoire, which as, as of this date, he is he's still there and he's under the protection of France and, and Cote d'Ivoire for reasons that we'll, uh, we'll explore. But again, this, these are two good sources I recommend. Um, now, okay, if we look at this map here, you can see on the left in the blue, these are the areas that were uh, tradition. Th th these are the areas of French uh, colonial hegemony. So you can see the French really did control uh, quite a lot of uh, of West Africa and and of Africa in, in a general sense. So I always say to my students that you know it's really if you want to really learn about Africa, you, you really should take French because. Um, if you only have English, you're only going to be able to travel in uh, Nigeria and Ghana. Uh, you know, I mean, you can, you can travel in these other places, but you're going to need somebody to translate for you. So, of course, England, uh, uh, you know, colonized Nigeria and Ghana. And so the legacy of that is these are today uh, Anglophone countries. But, but most of, of uh, uh, or, or a larger portion of, of this region was colonized by the French. Now, you can see there on the right where Burkina Faso is on this map. It was, uh, the French called it the former upper, you know, they called it the upper Volta, it's the former upper Volta. And, uh, and it was ch again, after the uh, revolution led by Thomas Sankara, it was changed to Burkina Faso, um, which means the land of the upright and virtuous people as we'll discuss. Uh, the, they, they, uh, uh, well, let's, let's move on. You can see, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that uh, momentarily. Now, um, we're going to be talking about, as we look at the question of Sankara and what happened to him as he was assassinated in a coup d'etat de uh, led by Blaise Kempore, um, we'll see that uh, uh, the situation in Burkina Faso was very similar to what took place in the Congo when uh, when Mombotu Sesu Seki uh, Seku excuse me uh, assassinated uh, led the uh, uh, coup against this again and the and, the, and had uh, Lumumba who was the president of uh, the Congo uh, executed uh, shot in a firing squad uh, 
Um, and so the, the, it's, it's quite interesting how the history of, uh, it tends to repeat itself in, in West Africa. And so uh, that's, that's, we'll, we'll, this is something that we're going to uh, explore. And we'll talk about who these people are, who Lumumba is, who Mumbotu is, and how their story uh, is really echoed in the story of Sankara and Blaise Kampore as well. I can see my, my spacing is a little off there in my slides. So uh, under it says Patrice Lumumba Kampore. That's not, he's not Lumumba Kampore. He's just Patrice Lumumba. It's Blaise Kampore on the far end. Now Blaise Kampore, who's still alive, born in 1951, he's the one who murdered Thomas Sankara. And uh, there's Thomas Sankara right next to him. Uh, Mumbotu was the one who murdered Patrice uh, Lumumba. And, uh, and then assumed uh, the presidency of, uh, of what was then Zaire, as now the Democratic Republic of Congo, and, and ruled for, for many, many years, for three decades, and then doing, and during that time stole from the, the country's uh, coffers and uh, embezzled a lot of money and put them in Swiss bank accounts. Uh, the story of Blaise Kampore and his corruption is, is quite similar, as we'll see. Now, uh, it's, it's Norbert Zongo was a Burkina Bay journalist who lived from 1949 to 1998. He was murdered by Blaise Kampore's as well, or, well, it was, it was, uh, it's hard to say. It's, it was his brother, Blaise Kampore's brother, Francois Kampore, has been charged in this murder along with the, 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 the military squad that was sent or dispatched to murder Zongo. I have a couple of lectures on Zongo uh, as well, which if you're, if you're interested, we'll look at the, in those lectures, the Mambotuization of, uh, of Burkina Faso. And uh, he was, Zongo was quite an up, outstanding man, uh, well, quite a journalist of great integrity. I, was, I had the opportunity to hear him speak in uh, Ouagadougou uh, bef uh, in, in, a, in a, few a few months before he was murdered. And uh, he, he wrote uh, a famous essay entitled The Mobotization of Burkina Faso, in which he, uh, you know, uh, observed or, or analyzed in a careful way the, the parallels between the Mobotu, uh, how, uh, let's say, Zaire was Mobotuized under Mobotu and how uh, Burkina Faso was Mobotuized under uh, Kampori. Now, this is a word that Zongo coined is a process that, that is not just uh, that, that has not just occurred in Zaire and Burkina Faso, but is unfortunately a process that, that one can observe, in, let's say, in a structural sense throughout the continent, uh, as 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 people fight for democratic rights and as they fight for free and open societies, they are constantly uh, plagued with these uh, corrupt uh, and, and 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 violent. Uh, dictators who are ruthless and will do anything they can to protect their wealth and power, including uh, you know murdering all of their uh, political uh, opponents. So we'll we'll uh, discuss that as well. But we want to, we want to be focused here on uh, Thomas Sankara and and what uh, and, and what he did, the, the good things that he did, and 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 really the very good man that he was, and his his quite. Uh, a significant accomplishments for one so young, and, and, in, a, and in a very short time, uh, he totally transformed uh, his his country. Now, there you see on the left a, a postage stamp from the French colonial era of the Moronaba. The Moronaba was the uh, was the king of the or the sovereign of the Masi people who lived in Ouagadougou. So, the Moro is essentially a king. And so uh, the French, as we're going to see, they, they tended to rule indirectly through uh, use of local, the local notables or uh, nobility. Um, they called the country Upper Volta. They, they, the French did, you know, the French had a policy in West Africa. And we see the legacy of this today when we look at some of the conflicts, like what's happening in Mali, the, the problem of the Touareg in Mali and the, and, the, and the fact that, the, you know, they want their independence and, uh, and the French, when they colonize that part, the, the traditional Touareg lands, this is just one instance of this, they, they divided up the traditional Touareg lands between Mali and Algeria, uh, Niger, Libya, and uh, consequently, they, they carved up what was the, what was the Touareg homeland like, like, like a big pie uh, in order to, again, uh, 
pursue this policy of divide and conquer. This is this is the French found this the most effective way to rule was to set different parties against one another. You know, let them, uh, you know, uh, go after one another, and then they they could just uh, rule in the aftermath of that. Now they they tried to do the the, the case of uh, Upper Volta. And what becomes Burkina Faso is a particularly interesting case because here the French failed. Uh, they did the, the Masi just refused. They would not have it. They would not allow the French to divide them. And the French wanted to divide them. They didn't want there to be an upper volta. They wanted part of it to go to Cote d'Ivoire, part of it to go to Mali, and part of it to go to Niger. And they were just going to cut the Masi right in, in, into three, like a big pie, into three pieces. And the Masi uh, successfully uh, resisted that plan. And as a consequence, the French created this other, they created another kind of uh, region that later became an independent nation state that, that was in the early days of decolonization was called Upper Volta. But then after the Sankara-led revolution in 84, uh, they, uh, the, the name of the country was changed. Now, again, uh, Faso is a, is a full day word. It means land. Burkina is Masi or More word, which means, you know, a virtuous, upright people. So it's, it's very interesting that the, the name of the country itself is the land of the upright or the land of the virtuous people, the morally incorruptible people. This is, this was deliberately chosen in, uh, by Sankara in the face of the, 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 the period of corruption that had existed in, uh, in, in Upper Volta during French rule, uh, in which, again, some of the nobility were complicit with the French. And there, there were, you know, Mas, the Masi people, uh, just to I give you one instance, they're, they're more than just Masi in, in uh, Burkina Faso. But I just, as, as an example, the Masi, who are uh, the largest ethnic group in Burkina Faso, they traditionally, they're a very old uh, culture. And they're very moral people. They, they place great uh, 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 value on, on high ethical standards and moral integrity and responsibility. And so um, the feeling that many had was that, that under colonization and in the early days of uh, decolonization, uh, or what one might call neo-colonization, that the, the, the people had felt that they'd been dirtied or soiled in, in some sense by, this, by the uh, years of corruption under the French and the problem, you know, the French exploitation. So uh, Sankara wanted to celebrate this idea of we are, you know, we are virtuous people. This is who we are. This is who we've always been. And uh, he wanted to place this idea of, of being uh, virtuous and up or upright right at the heart of, of uh, Burkina Bay identity. And so if you're Burkina Bay, it means you're, you're a virtuous person. And so, and, and so too, you know, Sankara, uh, as is also true of Zongo, placed a great premium on the importance of ethical, moral integrity and, and responsibility. And this was really uh, part of the reason for his appeal is that he was, he was that rare instance of, of a virtuous politician. We normally come to think of politicians as being uh, so corrupt, and here was a man that seemed to be himself uncorruptible, uh, and uh, this this is part of the reason why he is he remains today a figure that's so compelling for so many. Now, here you can see uh, a map that shows you the principal ethnic groups in uh, in, in the Upper Volta or the what's now Burkina Faso. You can see the Masi there in the middle, the the the, the Pular, the Fulani pull uh, uh, above and uh, uh, these are the set the pular are, are again uh, from you know again similar to the pull from uh, from Messina from Sokoto from the Futatora Futajalan the, the Falani are so historically associated with cattle and uh, and they are uh, they are also associated with Islam and uh, the, the Tijani the Kadria Whereas, uh, whereas the Masi for many, many years were animists and they were animists who were, who were staunchly animists and really resisted Islamization, resisted conversion to Islam and remained quite loyal to their, uh, to their uh, animist uh, values. 
And uh, the, in the Bobo area, these are the, these are related to the Manda. You have like the Jula as part of the Manda, like a Sunjiata Kaid. And there are, other, there are other ethnic groups as well in Burkina Faso. But as I said, Thomas Sankara uh, was, uh, was, was Masi, but he was a Masi Pole. And this was a, uh, an ethnic group that had a problematic identity uh, within a culture that, that very much valued uh, this, this tr these traditional uh, ethnic distinctions and identities. In fact, and among the Masi, there's a group called the Yoyantse, and the Yoyantse are the ancestors of the earth. They're the, they're the ethnic group that has been there the longest, and uh, they are Masi, but they're a subgroup within the Masi that, um, you know, that, that are, are considered to be essentially uh, nobles, and they, um, uh, they extend back, you know, more than a thousand years. Uh, Norbert Zongo was Yo Yangtze, which is sort of interesting to think that although they're the Zongo and, and Sankara, their political values are very similar, but um, uh, Sankara on the one hand came from this uh, this other the, this this less prestigious ethnic group, uh, whereas uh, Zongo came from the oldest uh, ethnic group, and so the part of it, like for instance, the outrage when when Kempore had Zongo killed, uh, he was killed in a firebomb, and the uh, the way in which he was killed, the desecration of his body, it was was shocking, you know, for the for the Masi, particularly given the fact that Zongo was one of these Yo, -Yo Yantzi Masi peoples. Now, um, here you can see some images of, of the Masi. There on the on the uh, on the far right in the corner is the more Naba. There's a on the far left is a traditional headset, and you see a little girl, and, and then under on, on the on the far right at the bottom. These are some images of what the houses of the Masi look like, particularly as you get outside of Burkina Faso. Now, Burkina Faso has become a more of a modern city, but but the people who live in, in the rural countryside, what what uh, Sankara is going to call the peasantry, the peasants are, are, are lead very austere uh, existence indeed. And, and part you know part of the problem that he was combating was the high mortality rates of children and you know who died of, of things like meningitis and uh, you know diarrhea and, uh, and malaria diseases that were compatible uh, and so uh, the, he, he was Sankara was very much aware of, of the very difficult uh, conditions that his people faced and the need to to address them and and, and the, the, the what he felt was a very uh, immoral, uh, actions on the part of, of the um, what we will see as the comprador class or the the middle class who ruled effectively indirectly indirectly on behalf of the French and and used their positions of prestige in order to you know put money in their own pockets while ignoring the plights of those who who led very uh, difficult existences in more rural areas. Um, th this is an image I took in Burkina Faso in the mid '90s. These are just some kids. The 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 uh, is typical street cuisine. The, the, the very very one, like I said, very wonderful, warm, hospitable people you find in in Burkina Faso. Uh, it's it's just, there's just uh, a feeling of warmth that you get that, that you don't often uh, get. Like for instance, if you're in Abidjan, it's more of a you know it's a bustling you know urban area where people aren't as don't tend to be as welcoming and as friendly as opposed to uh, this is a very kind of a laid back Sahelian feeling that you have when you're in uh, Burkina Faso uh, and in uh, Ouagadougou. Here, I just wanted you to see some images of what, you know, ordinary Burkina Bay people uh, look like. Uh, this was a picture I took at a wedding. These are just some ordinary everyday people, very, very kind and, and uh uh, you know, generous people. Now here are, uh, here is some images of, wa of modern Ouagadougou. Um, you might note on the, on the far left at the bottom that those are like, are, are, that's a sculpture that is t intended to look like film canisters. Ouagadougou is the site of uh, FESPACO, which is a prominent Pan-African uh, film festival. So it's like the African uh, version of Cannes uh, Film Festival or Sundance. It's where uh, where African filmmakers come from all over the continent every other year in February, odd years in February, to show their films. The weather at that time of year is perfect, and you can sit and watch movies in the open air. 
theaters at night, and um, uh, it's it's a uh, uh, it's it's a lot of uh, fun uh, to do that, and and you see some really wonderful African films and African uh, Fespaco Waga was always at the heart of, of filmmaking in uh, in Africa. And, uh, and, and that Africa does indeed have a very vibrant film uh, industry as well. WAG is uh, crucial to that. Now you can see some other images. On, on the far right, you see at the bottom, you can see a uh, Catholic uh, church. There's predom there, there are many Catholics that live in, uh, in Burkina Faso. Uh, now, when I was living there, you had uh, more Catholics than you had Muslims. That, that number has shifted a bit. Um, and, and now you have sort of, there are also problems of, of uh, Islamist activity in the north, which didn't really exist at the time that I was there in the mid 90s. And we'll, we'll, we can address that. But um, historically, unlike, let's say, Mali and Niger, which um, are uh, countries that are predominantly Muslim, Burkina Faso has uh, had a mixed population of Christian, Muslim, and animist. And they've, they've always lived a very comfortably side by side. There's, there's not much conflict. Muslims marry Christians and so on. Christians marry Muslims. Uh, but uh, that's unfortunately, there, there are some tensions today that, don't, but th that are not really related to the question of Sankara because they developed later. And so we'll only talk about them in passing here. But uh, traditionally, Muslims and Christians have gotten along very well. And, and the center there at the top, you see an image of the, of the Grand Mosque in uh, Ouagadougou. Both the Grand Mosque and the Catholic Church there are uh, in uh, Ouagadougou. And you'll find, again, Catholics and Muslims. And then you just see some, some of the development that's taken place with more, some of the modern buildings. And, and then on the top of uh, right, uh, you'll see just this ordinary street scene of what it looks like to live in Burkina Faso. It's a very, very nice place to live. Uh, now, um, uh, Thomas Sankara, uh, he, let, I, I want to just take a few moments and go through this timeline. And uh, just these, there, there, are other, there are plenty of points that we could make about this, but I wanted to just look at some of the basics here just to put it in a historical perspective. So in 1949, he was born in Yako in Burkina Faso, and it was in 1959 that uh, Maurice uh, Yamiogo was elected president of what you know, the French call autonomous upper volt. And I put autonomous in uh, quotes there because it wasn't really autonomous at all. It was a neo-colonial state. And the, the, when, when, the, uh, when the French packed up and, and went home, they installed people in positions of authority who would continue to serve the interests of the French. So uh, this was a period of, for, for Sankar, as we're going to see, this was a period of neo-colonization. Uh, now, in 1960, the, uh, Burkina Faso officially got its independence from France. And it was in, if we want to put, again, put this in the context of Sankara's life, he was in 1970, he went into military training in Madagascar. And in 74 through 75, Burkina Faso got into a war with Mali, a territorial dispute, which he, uh, he was a veteran of that war, and he was even celebrated for his exploits as, as a soldier. But um, he later said that this was a totally useless war that should have never taken place. So he, he felt it was really a waste of human life and a waste, waste of time. Uh, but he did or, uh, have some military experience in that conflict. Now, in 1978, Thomas Sankara met uh, Blaise Kempor. This is where they first met when they were in parachute school together in Rabat in, in Morocco. And so they, they became friends. And so here's one of the ironies is that uh, Kempore and Sankara were, were actually friends. And so when, Com when Kempore orchestrated the coup against Sankara, uh, he, was do he was doing, he was betraying not only his country, uh, but he was betraying his uh, a close friend of his. So he was really kind of Kampori was the, sort of this figure that was uh, you know was was very crafty, was lurking in in the shadows, and uh, and then later he he will strike, and then rise to power. But uh, but they they met at this uh, parachute school, and they became uh, close. And for instance, Sankara attended the wedding of Kampori. 
when he married the daughter, Félix Uffé Bonnier, which we'll, we'll discuss. But in 1981, Sankara was appointed information secretary uh, to President uh, Zerbo at that time. And it was in 1982 that there was a coup against Zerbo and uh, Jean-Baptiste Wadrego was named president. Uh, it was uh, in 1983 that Sankara himself became president of Upper Volta and, uh, and then again changed the name to Burkina Faso. In 84, he was awarded the Jose Marti Order in Cuba by Fidel Castro. He, was, uh, uh, he went to Cuba on a, on a number of occasions and uh, was given this award by Castro. In 1984, Thomas Sankara gave his speech at the United Nations, also first at Harlem, as I said previously. And then in 1987, he was assassinated in the coup led by uh, Compore. So um, one might note then that um, that this he, he was president of Burkina Faso during the period of the Cold War. And, uh, and, and, and partly what begins to happen is as we get towards the late 80s and early 90s, where, where we have the collapse of the Soviet Union, that this causes a, 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 a essentially a collapse throughout Africa and other parts in the former, uh, you know, a so, a socialist world, um, and uh, and this happens in, in Burkina Faso as well in, in terms of the, the the Marxism. I mean, what basically what happened in the United States was that the United States was uh, uh, State Department was funneling a lot of money to prop up countries. Um, like let's say uh, Liberia, where um, you know, uh, in, in order so that, so that they wouldn't go Marxist, for instance, in the way that Burkina Faso did. Um, after the Cold War ended, the United States took a lot of that money out of uh, places like uh, uh, Liberia, and they began channeling it into the former uh, so Soviet socialist states in Eastern Europe. Uh, because they, they wanted they wanted those states to become liberal democracies uh, with capitalist uh, economies uh, rather than be socialist, but this caused a collapse and in uh, in in Africa, like for instance in the case of Liberia, um, there there was a collapse uh, of the infrastructure, which led to a period of of terrible uh, anarchy and tribalism. So. Uh, there, there were there were many. My point here is that there were many different political events in the backdrop of, of these uh, uh, of these kinds of assassinations that took place, and uh, so there, were, there was a, there was a world. Uh, a, this was the Cold War. Is the short short way of saying that where all these events took place in the context of the Cold War. Now, uh, Sankara was, uh, now you say, you could say Sankara was a Marxist. I've already said he was a fanonist, but, but really uh, there, there is a sense in which Sankara was far more influenced by Lenin than he was by Marx, particularly Lenin's book entitled Imperialism, The Highest Stage of Capitalism, which was published in 1917. And, uh, and you know, Sankara had the collected works of Lenin. He read all of them. He was, he was a very uh, learned, uh, even brilliant person. But uh, the, 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 the writings of Lenin were important to Sankara. And part of the reason they were is because the situation that Lenin faced when he took charge of, of, what, of Russia, what then became the Soviet Union, was, was not unlike the situation that Sankara confronted in Burkina Faso in the sense that uh, you know, Marx had always theorized that if there was to be a socialist revolution, it would take place in an advanced industrial capitalist society. And he thought uh, it would be in England that this is where uh, the, the socialist revolution would happen. Well, it didn't happen in England. It happened in uh, Russia. And the Russian people at that time were, you know, there, there were a lot of serfs and there was a, a, a the prominent class of the nobility that figures like, say, Leo Tolstoy. Uh, belong to, and he writes about in novels like Anna Karenina and War and Peace. And, uh, and so uh, Lenin had to really adjust the thinking of Marx to, to fit his particular context, which one you could say, to put this in, in Marxian terms, you could say, you know, Russia goes from a feudal mode of production to a, uh, you know, to a socialist mode of production, and then it, but it has to go through 
an abbreviated period of capitalism as well. And so um, uh, Sankara was dealing with a very similar situation in that his country was certainly not an advanced industrial capitalist society, but was a society that was more akin to a European feudal society with, with peasants and lords and, uh, and, and knights and so on. So the situation in Burkina Faso, um, you know, Lenin he found to be more uh, helpful for him as he formed his own way of thinking about how to better transform his society. So you could say Sankara was a Leninist, all right? But he was also influenced very much, as I said previously, by Franz Fanon. Now, uh, Fanon lived from 1925 to 1961. He wrote a number of really important works. The, the Wretched of the Earth, which was published in 1961, was uh, arguably his most important work in the sense of its, you know, what, of what it, uh, how it influenced the decolonization movements throughout the world, not just in Africa, but, but throughout the world. And is, is it, the Wretched of the Earth was essentially a handbook for revolution. Black Skin, White Masks is, is a really fascinating. If you're interested in critical theory, um, I find it fascinating for the way in which it's, it's um, in addition to being of, of really significant theoretical interest, it's also, generically speaking, it blends personal narrative and theory. It's a very dynamic and uh, provocative book. Um, but, but The Wretched of the Earth deals more explicitly with uh, how to decolonize uh, what to be worried about, and so on. Now, again, uh, Fanon didn't live to see, uh, how, you know, his what his predictions and his analyses, how they would bear out, but many of them proved to be quite uh, prophetic, in, in fact. And so it was Fanon that's going to say in The Wretched of the Earth, he says, everything, and up, everything up to and including the very different nature of pre-capitalist society so well explained by Marx, must here be thought out again, here as in Africa. In the case of Fanon, he was writing from the context of Algeria. He became a citizen of Algeria, although he grew up in Martinique, was educated in Paris. He became an Algerian citizen and an Algerian revolutionary. So he, it wasn't African. Uh, he was talking about the situation of Africa, uh, but a little further north from where Sankara was in Burkina Faso. As the governing race is first and foremost those who come from elsewhere, those who are unlike the original inhabitants, the others. Okay, now, one of the things that, uh, that, that Sankara says repeatedly, you know, Sankara also liked to quote the Monroe Doctrine of James Monroe in the United States, or like America for Americans. Uh, and he said, that's basically what he was saying, that's all I'm saying in, in Burkina Faso is uh, Burkina Faso for the Burkina Bay, is that, that uh, this shouldn't, this, this is our... Uh, land and so uh, if you're an outsider, you know, hands off. Uh, but um, and we'll 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 return to that. But uh, but the the uh, the point that that Fanon here is making about Marx is that Marx, uh, as influential as Marx is and was, and the same what could be said for Lenin, they really were theorizing the European context, and so. Fanon was aware that when, when you're talking about Africa, even if you like Marx, you know, you really can't, you really have to adjust it to, to fit the situation of Africa, which was quite a different situation. And, and one of the things that made it so different was the question of colonization and the, the, the fact of European colonization and, and the need to uh, expel the colonizer uh, from uh, your your national setting, and so uh, so we could say that that Sankara, uh, Marxism, if, as well as the case of Fanon, was certainly adjusted for the African context or to fit the African context. Now this also plays into this idea of what you know this uh, this term the third world, which many people view today as a pejorative term. Um, at the time that it was coined at the Bandung Conference in the mid fifties. It was a celebratory term in the sense that, again, the context was the Cold War. First world was Europe and the United States. Second world, the Soviet Union. The idea of the third world meant to, to it, wasn't, it wasn't meant to be hierarchical, those, those third, so-called third world intellectuals who endorsed it, but rather uh, it, it was the, the, what one wanted to underscore was the question of non-alignment, that, that we're, not, we're not one or the other, we're, we're something else. It's, it's, another, it's another world that's non-aligned, that doesn't want to have to choose between you know the, the, these two uh, you know powers.
So, okay, so here are some of the policies of Sankara and, and some of his accomplishments, which, which I just want to quickly review before we look at his uh, actual language. One is the fight against corruption. Very obviously, that's clear in the name of the country. Uh, Patrice uh, Ilboudou, who was a Burkina Bay writer, coined this word toiletage, which, which you know, in the uh, context of uh, decolonization, which means cleaning up. Again, as I said, the, the Masi and the Burkina Bay people in general very, have very high ethical moral standards and value moral ethical integrity. And so you find this as a theme, not just in Sankara, but in, uh, in, in Burkina Bay society at large, the idea that, that you know, now we need to clean up. You know, we, we've been soiled by colonization and the complicity of some of us in our society with it. So we need, we need to clean up a bit. And secondly, we say fight for self-sufficiency and for true independence, not just flag independence, pseudo independence, not what, you know, Fanon calls black skin, white masks, where, you know, you, you have black people that are uh, running the country, but are actually serving the policy of white people in, in Europe and elsewhere, uh, but actual real independence, real uh, self-sufficiency without a need for uh, financial support from the external world. So there was also Sankara liked to emphasize the fight against illiteracy, the fight for children's education uh, in a context where children often had to you know, leave school if they went at all at a very early age to financially support their uh, their, their families to, to, to uh, build literacy and build education in the most rural and impoverished parts of the country. He launched also vaccine, vaccination campaigns uh, to fight against illness. And he would, he would, he would call them commando vaccine campaigns where he would go out in a period of just six weeks to a couple of months. His military would just massively vaccinate people in, in the countryside. It was really these kinds of innovative, creative projects that he started to, um, uh, to, um, you know, to transform his country, but to have the Burkina Bay themselves transform his country rather than, uh, uh, outside, you know, NGOs. He was not, he didn't want, uh, you know, support from NGOs or from, you know, he, for instance, he, he uh, expelled the Peace Corps. You know, he wanted the Burkina, the, you know, self-sufficiency uh, without reliance upon others, without, you know, uh, relying on uh, charity. We do it for ourselves and we, you know, we're poor, but we have the willpower and, and the manpower, the women power. We can, we can do this was sort of was, was the uh, idea. Uh, we don't need uh, help that's just going to make us more and more dependent. So he fought also for better living and working conditions for the poor. He was, he fought, you know, he had a certain echo consciousness. He fought against uh, deforestation and desertification. He built schools, health clinics, roads, dug wells in the rural areas. Now he also instituted rent-free lodging in, uh, in Ouagadougou. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, this, this was like, for instance, one year he said, this is uh, for a whole year, no one's going to pay rent. Well, this obviously infuriated the landlords, but it didn't infuriate those who were, uh, were renting. We're seeing this now in the United States in the context of COVID. You know, many people who, because of the COVID crisis, are thrown out of work are also asking for, uh, you know, for, for rent-free lodging. And, and, um, and this is what he, uh, he implemented. And so he fought also, he was a, a, a strong champion for women's rights, including the fight against female genital mutilation. Uh, in, in the second lecture, we're going to look at his speech on, on women's rights, very famous speech. And uh, it, it gives you a really kind of an insight into how much ahead of his time he really was. Uh, he, he, he articulated views about the rights of women that, that were just, you heard these. You heard it nowhere. Uh, it was just um, nowhere in in Africa, anyway. And uh, it was. It's really uh, was astounding and outstanding. Uh, and and hit, and today he remains again a source of inspiration for many of those who fight for women's rights throughout the world. Uh, he fought against the IMF and the World Bank. He fought against foreign debt. Now, the IMF is the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. These agencies that uh, that develop, you know debtor dependency relationships with uh, nations like Burkina Faso that give lots of money uh, with many kinds of strings attached to it, including structural adjustment. Uh, 
uh, which is, you know, like for instance, uh, when I was there, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the structural adjustment, the people who wanted structural adjustments to Burkina Faso's economy would mandate how many people could uh, could, could uh, take be, be students of English, uh, for instance, that you know that you couldn't have too many. You had to have a certain number, and so this meant that some people were excluded uh, because they had to follow the policies implemented externally by the World Bank and by. Uh, the IMF. I had to like the first year that I taught in Burkina Faso. I had like my, I think it was like 125 students in my first year. The first year students, the second year students, it went down to like 40, and then the third year 30, and then down to 13. It was very, you know, you had to make very difficult evaluative decisions, um, and so students couldn't just take what they wanted. And this was largely because of policies uh, that were. Uh, is externally imposed upon Burkina Faso. Now, uh, now Sankara, one of the things that he shared again with Fanon was he was opposed to, the, to this idea of foreign debt. You know, Fanon makes the argument, he says, you know, Europe's literally the creation of Africa of, of th through the spoils that were taken from Africa. And yet here is Europe with all of this, the wealth that, that they gained from uh, colonization and, and, and we're the ones who are uh, in debt. We're the ones who are impoverished. Now, how is this just? Uh, Sankara urged other African leaders, uh, as well as uh, you know himself, to refuse to pay the foreign debt. It was not, in other words, the question shouldn't be a matter of debt. It should be a matter of reparation. And so this was this was also uh, one of the things that made him not very popular with uh, European bankers, as you can imagine. Uh, he fought for Pan-African solidarity, but when I say Pan-African solidarity, I don't necessarily mean in this case uh, simple, simply a solidarity among black Africans because he, for, for Sankara, he wants to insist, as we'll see, this is, you know, is, as he's going to say, there's only one color in Africa, and that is a unity because Africa is, is a diverse continent where you have uh, different ethnic groups, some white, for instance, Arab and Berber and Toreg and uh, Fulani and, and uh, black people. There's many different uh, ethnic groups. And so he wanted a kind of a solidarity that was not based on, on color. Uh, he was very much opposed to apartheid. This was the period when Nelson Mandela was still imprisoned in South Africa, and he was a strong critic of uh, Zionism as well, a supporter of Palestinian rights. And so when we live in an era where apartheid has been dismantled, but we still are affected by uh, Zionism and, and the uh, historically unjust society that the Israelis have built in Israel and, and the ongoing occupation of Palestinian lands in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, that problem it remains with us today. But Sankara uh, took a strong stand against it. Now, um, on October the 2nd, 1983, Sankara delivered his political orientation speech. And in this speech, he laid out what his uh, plan was uh, once he came to power and once his political group came to power. So let's, let's take a moment and look at what he, what he planned to do and what, what his vision of uh, a future Burkina Bay society was at this time. He said, the victory of the revolution and the advent of the national council of the revolution unquestionably constitute the confirmation and logical outcome of the Voltanic people's struggle against the subjugation of our country and of the independence, freedom, dignity, and progress of our people. Aspirations for democracy, liberty, and independence, for genuine progress, for a restoration of the dignity and grandeur of our homeland can finally be achieved. Aspirations that have been particularly flouted during 23 years of colonial rule. So again, we see that same emphasis here on you know the importance of the restoration of dignity. Now that that is something that doesn't get perhaps discussed as much as it should. That's even a more of a Hegelian theme than a Marxian theme. But the idea that you know uh, one's dignity, uh, the, the colonization has has wounded one's uh, dignity, and uh, in addition to uh, exploiting one in an economic sense as well. And so uh, the the brief period. Uh, before uh, Sankara was a period not really of independence, but a period of neo-colonization, which independence was a kind of a, uh, a, a farce in, in effect. 
uh, here's here's Fanon. The legacy, uh, excuse me, Sankar, the legacy bequeathed to us by 23 years of imperialist exploitation and domination is a heavy one. The task of constructing a new society cleansed of all the ills that keep our country in a state of poverty and economic and cultural backwardness will be long and hard. The decision by French colonial imperialism to cut its losses was a victory for our people over the forces of foreign oppression and exploitation. From the masses point of view, it was a democratic reform, while from that of imperialism, it was a change in the forms of domination and exploitation of our people. Okay, so uh, again, note there, he says uh, that, that once the French colonial imperialists realized they could no longer continue to uh, rule in this sort of brutal, naked, exploitive way, uh, they just became a little bit more crafty. So the domination and exploitation continued, but the forms of it uh, shifted. And so Fanon analyzes this as well, why this happened and, and what to do to prevent it from happening in, in the future. Um, now, he's, as he looked at the situation in Burkina Faso, he, he identified key groups in this struggle, which I think is really worth looking at because the, the struggle that he's describing was not a struggle only uh, limited to Burkina Faso, but was a struggle that was more, you saw more generally replicated throughout the uh, African context. So by studying the Burkina Bay context, one can gain a lot of insight into what took place in other national settings as well. So we can say, well, there was this struggle that's, that, that took place um, after the French, you know, packed up and left, or at least had the appearance of having packed up and left instead, of, but when, when in fact they were effectively ruling from their embassy in Ouagadougou, um, you had different groups in this struggle. So on one side, you had to say the French nationals or the neo-imperialists, the new imperialists, who uh, wanted to continue to exploit the country economically in the same way that they always had, uh, but they, they had to now do it indirectly. And so what, what comes into being is what, you know, Franz Fanon is going to call, and also Emil Cabril will call this comprador class. Uh, this, is, this is a bourgeoisie class or a middle class but, but the difference, which uh, Fanon and Sankara and Cabrilla, et cetera, uh, like to emphasize, is the, the European bourgeoisie or the middle class was, an actual, was a class that had actual historical vitality. That actually, comp and, and Marx says this himself in the Communist Manifesto, that had great uh, achievements um, in terms of you know, manufacturing and uh, uh, production. So there was a certain... Uh, authenticity and reality, vitality to the European bourgeoisie or middle class, but but in Africa, no such class existed. You know, Africa was ruled by the French uh, the French people, uh, and it was ruled, uh, but through it, what called, what the system of colonization called indirect rule, uh, in which the nobility, the traditional nobility, and, and I'm putting the word feudal. In, uh, in quotes here, because the feudalism, you know, we think of the, in Marxism, we think of the feudal mode of production or the feudal era in Europe, um, you know, we, we, again, because we have to adjust, uh, if we're thinking in the way Sankara wants us to think, you know, we have to adjust this, even the term feudal, or, or let's say Fanon would argue, from its European setting to this other setting. And so they're, they're, par they're not exactly the same, but there are certain parallels. Now, um, so what, what the French did then was they, they would install certain members of the nobility to rule on their behalf. And, uh, and so the, the nobles who had been traditionally the people like the, the, the noble chiefs, for instance, the chieftains in the rural areas, and, uh, and they, would, uh, they would gain benefits from this you know, relationship that they had with the French. Um, but the uh, but the bourgeoisie or the middle class, what, what uh, you know again Fanon calls the comprador class, had to be engineered or invented by the colonizers uh, in in order to indirectly rule on on their behalf. And so we're talking about somebody as a member of the comprador class. It might be say somebody who was a very bright uh, young person who would be handpicked to go to a French language school. Uh, this was true of Sankara and Campori both, and uh, they were educated in the French Catholic school system. You know, you, you would get selected if you were, uh, if you seemed to be particularly promising. And if you were really promising, then you could get sent to, uh, to Paris. Uh, 
and you could further your education. This would say, for instance, the story of Leopold Sadar Senghor in Senegal, um, and so that who was one of the you know founders or fathers of the Negritude movement, also a very great poet and Senegal's first president. Um, and they would then um, rule the country, on, but on behalf of the, the French. And so they were, in effect, middlemen. They were, um, they they trafficked in goods, and they, uh, they 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 got great rewards financially by serving the French instead of serving their own people. But they were a kind of a parasitical class, in effect. Now, uh, and, and, they, and Fanon's even going to say that there's only one thing the Comprador intellectual can do, or the members of the Comprador class, you know, and that's just commit suicide. He didn't mean that literally, but he meant they should become, he, he uh, quoting Antonio Gramsci, he, he spoke of what he called this idea of the organic intellectual. They should be, um, you know, they, they should blend back into the, into the people and serve the people instead of serving the, uh, the foreign nationals. Okay, so there, so on one side of the struggle you had these people, and on the other side you have what uh, what Sankara is going to call the proletariat or the working class. Now, in the in the case of West Africa, the the proletariat was a very small. I will say, in the case of Burkina Faso, anyway, the, the, the what he, what he calls the proletariat, the working class, was not a very large class. the 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 vast majority. Um, were of, of the people in Burkina Faso were the peasant class. And th these were the very poor rural people. And so when we think of like the in traditional Marxism, we think of the struggle between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Well, in the way that Marx theorized, it just doesn't really work in this, in this context. So there was a proletariat, there was a working class, but it was a smaller um, component of, of uh, or, or social group as opposed to the peasant class, which was very large and it was, it was the, the labor, the, 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 the hardship, the struggle really fell on their shoulders. Um, now, the what he called the petty bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie were individuals who um, would, uh, they, they were members of the bourgeoisie and they, in, in uh, the, these, these were people who might, you know, be, one day uh, inspired by the revolution and the next more interested in their protecting their privileges. And so they were not really a trustworthy group because you never really knew, uh, you know, what side they were on because they themselves didn't know they might be there like, you know, blowing in the wind a little bit. And so, but, but they, they also could be revolutionized as well. Sankara felt, um, although they, they, they were, it's possible that they might betray you too. Um, and then the Lupin proletariat, these were, again, kind of like poor of the poor. Uh, this was, a, I think, for, for Sankara, a particularly dangerous group because um, they could e quite easily become mercenary uh, because of their impoverishment. So, but but uh, he, he wanted to uh, educate and uh, revolutionize the Lupin proletariat as well. Now, um, there are other, besides Sankara, I just want to draw attention to some other important theorists here of, 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 of colonization, of post-colonization and neo-colonization. Uh, we've been talking about Fanon in the middle. You see Nungugiwa Thuongo uh, prior to uh, his uh, re assuming his African name. He went by his Christianized name of James Nungugi. He published his first three or four novels under the name of James Nungugi and then, and then ceased publishing under that name. But he wrote a very wonderful book, which I reckon, uh, recommend strongly, called Decolonizing the Mind. His thinking is very uh, fanonist, very akin to the thinking of Sankara, but applied to, to the study of literature. So if you're interested in literature and literary theory, I mean, whereas, for instance, you know, Sankara is thinking more in terms of being a politician and, and implementing these policies in his, in his homeland, Nungugi's thinking these, some of these same thoughts and applying them to uh, the study of literature. And one of the conclusions Nungugi will come to is that if you're an African writer, you should write in an African language. If you continue to write in English, you're, uh, you're enriching the English language, but you're not enriching an African language. And so he uh, began writing in uh, his own his native language of Kukuyu and stopped writing at a certain point in his uh, uh, in, in English, as he had written in his first uh, early novels, he was also again one of these bright handpicked people. He, in this in his case, since he was Kenyan, he was uh, it was the British that that sent him uh, that educated him. He went to school in Leeds in England, uh, 
and uh, he was, but he was, the, the British wanted him to be a compador. It didn't quite turn out the way they had hoped. And then there's Amilcar Cabril as well. He's another very important uh, theorist of post-coloniality, neo-colonial. And I, I, I mention this because, again, uh, sometimes this word post-colonialism is used. And you have to be kind of careful with it because the, the problem with the word post-colonial, like post-colonial theory or post-colonial literature, is that it implies that colonization is something that is that is over, that is past. And this other word, neo colonialism, neo-imperialism, really underscores how uh, imperialism is an ongoing situation. The situation has changed from the era, from the colonial imperial era, but the, set, but the, the conditions of exploitation have not. Um, I, I also draw attention, your attention to Hala by Simbane Usmane, that particularly the opening segment of this film illustrates this beautifully. You see uh, the, the foreign advisor standing behind the, uh, the African government officials giving them their briefcases that are filled with, with, uh, with dollars or with, with the CIFA, that is, uh, with money. Uh, again, you know, the comprador would be a figure who would be bribed essentially by the French to, to rule the country on behalf of the French. So again, Fanon, as Fanon puts it, black skin, white masks. Uh, and in, in Hala, Hala is a wonderful film because uh, Al Haji, you see him at the far uh, left with his, with his, uh, leaning over his briefcase, coveting it, uh, is suffers from impotence, uh, and he has to go to a, uh, a marabou to cure him of his impotence. And, and so Hala is, is like kind of a curse, and the curse is the curse of, of impotence. He can't get an erection. And, uh, and this, this is an, has an allegorical meaning as well for Simba and Usman, because this is essentially the, the condition of what Fanon and Sakar are calling the comprador, is somebody who is, is literally... Uh, impotent, and, uh, and and yet you know using his position, his education, and his uh, position of, uh, to to enrich himself at the expense of what Fanon will call you know the wretched of the earth or, or the poor of the poor. Now um, here's here's Sankar. He says. Uh, of, of the comparator class. He says, our revolution is a revolution that is unfolding in a backward agricultural country where the weight of tradition and ideology emanating from a feudal type social organization weighs very heavily on the popular masses. What characterizes the bourgeoisie in underdeveloped countries is its congenial inability to revolutionize society as the bourgeoisie of Europe did in the 1780s. That is in the epic when the European bourgeoisie was still an ascending class. All right, so th this is a very fanonist uh, argument. Uh, again, that the, the bourgeoisie, when, when, when Sankar uses the word bourgeoisie here, you can just insert comprador, it means the same thing. That it's not, it has no real vitality in the way that the European bourgeoisie did. So it's like El Haji, this, this is an impotent uh, bourgeoisie. Here's uh, Sankar. In essence, neo-colonial society and colonial society differed not at all. The colonial administration was replaced by a neo-colonial administration identical to it in every respect. With the support and blessing of imperialism, Voltanic, which later became Burkina Bay, nationals set about organizing the systematic plunder of our country, just like El Haji and, and Hala. With the crumbs of this pillage that fell to them, they were transformed little by little into a truly parasitic bourgeoisie that could no longer control its voracious appetite. Uh, in the case of the Hala, in the film Hala, it's, uh, El Haji's wanting to take his third wife. I mean, he's, you know, he, 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 he has a voracious sexual appetite uh, as well. Uh, driven solely by personal interest, they no longer hesitated at even the most dishonest means, engaging in massive corruption, embezzlement of public funds and properties, and practicing favoritism and nepotism. Uh, yeah, nepotism, hiring your own relatives. Blaise Compore was, was a champion of this. Uh, as 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 is our current president in the United States, you know, like putting your your own people close to you in in positions of power, and so he's saying, you know, there, there's really no difference. I mean, if there was a difference at all, we could think of the shift from you know kind of a race oppression uh, to to class oppression, but the oppression is is essentially the same.
Here's Sankara. Hardly a year passed without they, these compradors, treating themselves to extravagant vacations abroad. Their children deserted the country schools for prestigious educations in other countries. All the resources of the state were mobilized to guarantee them at the slightest illness, expensive care, and luxury hospitals in foreign countries. All of this unfolded in full view of the honest, courageous, and hardworking Voltanic people, a people mired nonetheless in the most squalid misery. While Upper Volta is a paradise for the wealthy minority, it is a barely tolerable hell for the majority of the people. Now, this, this is not hyperbole. Uh, Burkina Faso, as I said, is a, is a, is a very poor country. And, and at this time, it was even poor. I mean, it, it, was, it was in very bad uh, shape. And, uh, and yet, at the same time, you had this, this, very, impo this very impoverished uh, people who, who were the vast majority living side by side with these, uh, with these individuals, these compradors who lived in these islands of great wealth and opulence. Uh, all because they served the interest of the French rather than the Burkina Bay. The parasitic classes that have always profited from colonial and neocolonial uh, neo upper vault are and will continue to be hostile to the transformations undertaken by the revolutionary process. They are and remain fervent defenders of the privileges they have acquired through their allegiance to imperialism, for them, our revolution will be the most authoritative thing there is. It will be an act through which the people will impose their will by all available means, including arms if necessary. Yeah, and so you can see here this idea of, of privilege. You know, we hear a lot today about, you know, white privilege, for instance, in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement. And privilege, you know, privilege, those people who have privileges are very keen to, to protect them. And so the, the Comprador class was this class that, you know, that, that very much wanted to cling to their privileges and, and Sankara had no illusions that they would be resisting this revolution uh, every step of the way. And, and they would see the revolution as being authoritative precisely because it would divest them of their privileges. Now I want, I want to note here that he says here uh, by all available means, including arms if necessary, or as Malcolm X said, by any means necessary. And uh, Fanon has a very similar view about what decolonization entails, which is uh, violence. And uh, we're going to, we'll, we'll return to that. But uh, so the other, I want to though, before we get into the question of, of violence and its relation to Fanon and Sankara, um, you know, this idea of Burkina Faso being a feudal mode of production, I've already said that it has to be adjusted. Now you see there in, in the middle, you see a picture of, of Europe, these uh, knights and kings. Uh, and then on the far uh, right, you see uh, Musa Mansa, who is a sovereign in uh, you know, Mali in the medieval period. Uh, so th there are, it's worth noting, you know, it's, it's not exactly the same the European feudal system and the African feudal system, but it's it's quite close. And so when Sankara theorizes the feudal mode of production, uh, he's he's really he really is referring to something that is a reality. Now it's not it's not the exact same reality as Europe, but there is a cast of notables uh, in uh, Burkina Faso and throughout the Sahel generally, and there are there was a large peasantry as well, and they did they were traditionally ruled by sovereigns, by kings, like for instance, the Askia Muhammad in the era of the Songhe dynasty of, of the Askias. Um, so he, uh, he uses these Marxist terms, Sankara, but he adjusts them to uh, set to fit the Burkina Bay setting. Now, mo a mode of production is a term coined by Marx. For Marx, there are about seven or eight mode of productions, the capitalist mode of production, the socialist mode of production, the feudal mode of production, um, the hunting and gathering mode of production, the primitive mode of production, and so on. Uh, and, and, but what a mode of production was is basically uh, a simple way to think of it is it's a mode of production is the way that a society organizes itself to address the problem of necessity or scarcity um, and or economic need. And so, you know, Marx is going to argue there are only so many ways that a society can organize itself to address the problems of economic necessity. The feudal mode of production was one of those ways. And so Sankara is suggesting that the, the mode of production 
prior to colonization, prior to imperialism, was in effect a feudal mode of production, which remains residual in uh, Burkina Faso in the sense that you still have a class of, of chieftains who are considered to be nobles or notables, who are like the nobles of Europe, uh, are nobles on the basis of their blood nobility. And so the question of nobility is always linked to the question of, of blood nobility. And this is one of the reasons why for the noble class, the class of the notables or nobles in West Africa, as is also true in the case of the European nobility, there's always a question of genealogy and, and, and careful preservation of one's blood lineages. And so, um, you know, you're, you're a king because of the blood that flows through your veins, or you're a duke, lord, prince, or whatever, through your, your uh, high arist aristocratic noble blood. So I want to really underscore this question of blood, because this is certainly one of the things that links the Burkina Bay context or the Sahelian context generally and the feudal context in Europe is its insistence on this ideology of blood uh, nobility. Here's uh, Sankara. He says, the reactionary forces who base their power on traditional feudal type structures of our society and who are in their majority uh, were able to put up staunch resistance to French imperialism. But since our country gained national sovereignty, they have joined forces with the reactionary bourgeoisie to oppress the Voltanic people. These reactionary forces most frequently rely on the decaying values of our traditional culture that still persist in the rural areas. These backward forces will oppose our revolution to the extent that it democratizes social relations in the countryside. These are the enemies of the people in the present revolution. Okay, so really interesting. So he's saying here that in the, in the era of French imperialism, many of these notables, they didn't want to be imperialized by the French because, they, because previously they had ruled the country themselves. Uh, but then the French, you know, installed them in, in positions of power and, and ruled indirectly. And many of them, and those that, those that were not willing to, like, let's say, you know, uh, figures like El Hajo Martel, uh, who were not willing to, uh, you know, live under French imperialism, they either fought it or, or they, you know, or they were killed. And it was those who were compliant that were able to continue to preserve their, their positions of privilege on the basis of their noble uh, status as you know, and again, noble heritage, blood status. Now, you could, one could speak of also in the Sahelian context of Sharif and ideology, because many of the notables in uh, the Sahel are notables based on claims to their their genealogical links to the family of the Prophet Muhammad. And so these these elaborate uh, genealogies, sometimes completely cooked up and and uh, uh, fraudulent, are nonetheless used to legitimize one's uh, privilege in what is essentially a class-based society of uh, nobility and, and what sometimes could be referred to as the Nyamakala or the, the lower uh, uh, class element in society. And so Sankara is very much aware of, of this class structure in Africa that, that's not a, was, that is pre-colonial, kind of a pre-colonial caste or class system that existed. And so those who profited by their claims to blood nobility uh, had no interest in losing their, uh, their privileges. And he did for, for Sankara, I mean, because if, 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 if Burkina Faso were to truly democratize social relations, they would be the ones who would have the most to lose. And so these, for Sankara, these, these are the enemies of the people, those protecting their privilege on the, on the basis of these bogus claims to blood nobility. Now, again, so here, here is in Sankara's language himself. He says, the people in the current revolution are composed of, number one, the Voltanic working class, uh, the young, these are young and few in number. These people have everything to gain, nothing to lose. And so that's why they're on our side. Uh, the petty bourgeoisie, this is a vast social layer, he says, that is very unstable and vacillates between the cause of the masses and that of imperialism. So they, it's kind of like what Martin Luther King called, you know, the white liberal. He said, I'd rather face a snarling dog than the white liberal because they, they tell you that they're on your side. Uh, and then, but they don't do, but they don't really, uh, it's just all, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's all, you know, lip service and, uh, you know, and, and, and they're not a very trustworthy class, uh, that you can't really rely upon them, but in, in, in principle and theory, they're, they're in favor of the revolution. 
And then the Voltanic peasantry, which for Sankara, this is the big majority of the small peasants. And these are the people who pay the highest price for imperialist exploitation. And then number four, the Lumpen proletariat. This is a term for Marxism. Uh, he says, a layer of declassed elements who, since they are without work, are inclined to hire themselves out to reactionary and counter-revolutionary forces to carry out the latter's dirty work. And so th this is the class which uh, needs to be, uh, you know, that needs to be educated in Sankara's view because they're just, you know, they're, they, can, they can go, you know, they'll, they'll fight like a mercenary. They'll fight for whoever pays the highest price, but ultimately it's in their interests that the revolution succeed because they're driven to do this kind of labor because of their dire economic circumstances. Here's Sankara's description of the peasant class. He says, the peasants, the wretched of the earth, quoting a grin directly, Fanon in Upper Volta, are expropriated, uh, ex appropriated, robbed, molested, imprisoned, ridiculed, and, and humiliated every day. Yet they are the ones whose labor creates wealth. It is the peasants who suffer most from the lack of buildings, roads, health facilities, and services. The peasants, creators of national wealth, are the ones who suffer the most from the lack of schools and educational materials for their children. Those who, need, who most need to learn uh, so that the output of their productive labor can increase are the very ones who benefit the least from expenditures for health care, education, and technology. So this, this is the class that he's most, uh, this is the most important class for him. It's the largest class as well. And they're the ones who pay the largest price and suffer the most from these French colonial and neo-colonial policies. Here's Sankara. The revolution has as its primary objective, the transfer of power from the hands of the Voltanic bourgeoisie, this comparable class, aligned with imperialism, the French, into the hands of the alliance of the popular classes that make up the people the actual people. The revolution as a correct theory for the destruction of the old order and the construction of a new type of society in its place can only be led by those who have a stake in it. The revolution aims to transform all economic, social, and cultural relations in society. It aims to create a new Voltanic man with an exemplary morality and social behavior that inspires the admiration and confidence of the masses. Okay, very, very interesting. Uh, and so, again, there, let's just note a couple of things here. The primary objective of the revolution is to transfer power from the comprador class to the, to the people. And this is why the comprador class is going to fight it tooth and nail. Uh, but also, um, I want to draw your attention to this idea of the construction of a new type of society, but also this idea of a new man. We can think of a kind of neo-humanism. Now, this is a very... Fanonist idea. This is that the very conclusion of the wretched of the earth. Fanon's going to say something very similar: is that you know European humanism is bankrupt. It's not humanism itself that is the problem for Fanon. It's it's the it's the European articulation of it. And so, if if colonization created a a, a distorted kind of man or or person for uh, in, in Burkina Faso, the colonized subject. The revolution for uh, Sankara will bring about the creation of, of a new man. Now, Fanon's going to say almost exactly the same thing. Okay. Now, I want to note here that this this transformation that we're talking about uh, for what one of the things that unites Sankara, Fanon, and we could even we could include Malcolm X. And this is famous, you know, by any means necessary uh, slogan is that Malcolm X was. Um, you know, he, Martin Luther King is often identified with nonviolence. In, in India, you know, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi was identified with nonviolent resistance as well. Uh, uh, Malcolm X, uh, he, he didn't really, it seems, he said, I'm not going to, you're asking me to go into a boxing ring and tie my hands behind my back. I'm not going to do it. You know, well, that, that Sankara's view is, is, is uh, more similar to the views of uh, Malcolm X. And I, and I think it's worth noting that uh, it's interesting, too, that all of, all of these men uh, were killed violently. Uh, but in the case of Mahatma Gandhi, who was, who was also assassinated, um, he was, uh, you know, he himself thought that his nonviolent resistance in India was a failure. And the evidence of this for him was the way in which 
you know, the former, you know, India, what had been both at that time, both India and Pakistan were, were divided, uh, you know, after, uh, you know, the, the British left and that the fact that India fragmented into a Muslim India and a Hindu India and then everything in between uh, was for him evidence of the failure of, of, of nonviolent resistance. And so I think it's, it's uh, uh, important to, to look a little bit more carefully at what is implied in those who uh, demonize or stigmatize figures like Malcolm X and Sankar and Fanon for advocating violent resistance, because what one has to put into context what they're actually saying about what violence uh, is. And, this, and they're, they're thinking about violence as, as the same kind of thinking you'll find in the thinking of Immanuel Kant, not just in the thinking of, uh, of say, of, of, of Karl Marx. Violence as a matter of you know history progressing through through conflict. This is a this is not this is a this is a Kantian idea that's at the heart of the UN as as well. Uh, so here here's Fanon. He's going to say uh, national liberation, national re uh, renaissance, the restoration of nationhood to the people, commonwealth, whatever may be the heading or the new formulation introduced. Decolonization is always a violent phenomenon. Decolonization is quite simply the replacing of a certain species of men. Without any period of transition, there is a total, complete, and absolute substitution. The last shall be first. We know where that comes from. Uh, decolonization is the putting into practice of this sentence. The native who puts it into practice is ready for violence at all times. So historical change, if, if historical change at all is to take place, again, as Malcolm X says, history is not, you know, it's, it's, it's just a part of, uh, you know, history. History uh, is, is the transformations of history inevitably occur through uh, violence. And, uh, but that word is often uh, seems uh, scary to those who uh, can, uh, are introduced to the thought of these figures. Uh, but they're simply talking about a reality. I mean, colonization was violent decolonization is also going to be violent. Here's Sankara. Uh, the revolution is different from destructive anarchy. It demands discipline and exemplary conduct. It represents a break from all previously known regimes. Its ultimate goal is to build a new volcanic society in which the volcanic citizen, motivated by the architect of his own happiness, equivalent to the energy he has expended. So uh, he's still speaking in the language of the Voltanic Society because Burkina Faso has not been uh, declared at this time, and the country hasn't been the name hasn't been changed. But I want to note here that uh, again, it's not revolution is not anarchy. Uh, it demands d discipline and exemplary conduct. And so he was he was not in favor of anarchy. Neither was Fanon. They were very much opposed to the idea of anarchy. And so I think it's important. To, to underscore that national liberation movements are not the same as movements that are anarchistic in nature and that are uh, the, the goal of a national liberation movement is effectively you know, liberty, which means freedom, but it means freedom uh, within the law. And to, to, to achieve this inquire, uh, requires great discipline and vigilance for Sankara. Now, uh, it was, again, as I said, it was Fanon that introduces this idea in the wretched of the earth of, of a new man denouncing European humanism, but articulating a new kind of humanism or neo-humanism. And but he also introduces this idea of a Manichaean allegory. So I just wanted to briefly uh, 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 mention these things because these are all important categories, concepts to know as you're thinking about uh, this kind of literature and reading the literature of this of, of the decolonized world. This al this Manichaean allegory that Fanon introduces is is very uh, basic concept for understanding you know postcolonial neocolonial literature and society. Here's Fanon. The colonial world is a Manichaean world. At times, this Manichaeanism goes to its logical conclusions and dehumanizes the native, or to speak plainly, it turns him into an animal. The native knows all this and laughs to himself every time he spots an allusion to the animal world in the other's words, for he knows that it, he is not an animal, and it is precisely at the moment he realizes his humanity that he begins to sharpen the weapons with which he will secure its victory. Okay, so if you're going, well, what is this word Manichaean? Well, he, it, it's uh, Manichaean. Uh, Manichaeans were a kind of a sect. Um, let me, I'll show you a picture here. Uh, 
Here's Manny. He lived from 216 to 274, and his, his doctrine spread uh, throughout the ancient world from the years 300 to 500. Augustine, in the Christian tradition, before he became a Christian, was, was a Manichaean. Uh, man, there are no Manichaeans anymore, at least not to my knowledge. But uh, the, the, the difference you know, between the Manichaean and the Christian is that the Christ, Christian uh, ideology or Christian religion is, is a monotheistic religion. In the case of the Manichaeans, um, the Manichaeans believed that there were two gods. So, it was a, so when Fanon uses this, he's not saying that literally there's people are still uh, you know, uh, following the doctrines of, of Manny, uh, but that it's, it's, it's a world that's completely divided in half. So for instance, Manny is going to say, uh, the, he'll explain the reason for the existence of evil because he's going to say there's a good God and an evil God. So it's, it's a world, ontologically speaking, it's a world that is divided. And so Fanon is using this as an allegory to uh, explain what's taking place in the colonized world. So uh, on the one hand, you have the colonizers and then you have the colonized. It's a Manichaean world. And so here's Fanon. He says, it, it so happens that when the native hears a speech about Western culture, he pulls out his knife, or at least he makes sure it's within his reach. Uh, in the period of decolonization, the colonized masses mock at these very Western values, insult them, and vomit them up. And this is because, again, you know, he's going to say, uh, M. A. Césaire says something very similar in his discourse on colonialism, is that humanism as uh, you know, as, as champion in Europe was, was meant humanism for a very particular kind of people. And so uh, it's basically uh, a con. And so one has to be very careful uh, with this word. So Fanon is not, you know, he's not rejecting humanism, but he's saying European humanism, we could put it in more contemporary terms. We could say European humanism needs to be deconstructed. It needs to be made more inclusive. Uh, and so it's it's a it's a humanism, but it's a humanism that has been retooled, re-engineered. Okay, here's uh, Sankar. The settler's work is to make e excuse me, this is Fanon. The settler's work is to make even dreams of liberty impossible for the native. The native's work is to imagine all possible methods for destroying the settler. On the logical plane, the Manichaeism of the settler produces a Manichaeanism of the native. To the theory of the absolute evil of the native, the theory of the absolute evil of the settler replies. For the native, life can only spring up again out of the rotting corpse of the settler. The mobilization of the masses, when it arises out of the war of liberation, introduces into each man's consciousness the ideas of a common cause, of a national destiny, and of a collective history. So, uh, you know, Sankara uses this idea, again, of Monroe Doctrine. If you don't know what that is, you should, you should look it up, but especially, particularly if you're, you're American citizen. Uh, and, uh, but, but for Sankara, what Fanon is saying, you know, one could read this and think, oh, my gosh, this seems very uh, uh, radical and be maybe disturbed by this idea of life springing up again out of the rotting corpse of the settler. And Fanon's, you know, language is very... Uh, you know, sometimes quite uh, dramatic and vivid. He certainly was a very gifted writer, uh, but uh, but but really, it's not. You know, as, as Sankara observes, what what Fanon is saying here is not really so different from what uh, was articulated in, in the Monroe Doctrine. You know, when when people who lived in the uh, what is today the United States said, "This is not." You know, the the lands of of this continent are not. You know, uh, are, are for the people who live. On this continent, not for uh, you know European powers to uh, play around with, and so what James Monroe was saying is also very similar to what uh, Fanon and Sankara were saying as well, at least in the way that Sankara interpreted the Monroe Doctrine. Here's Fanon: that same Europe where they were never done talking of man, and where they never stopped proclaiming that they were only anxious for the welfare of man. Today we know with what sufferings humanity has paid for every one of their triumphs of the mind. Come then, comrades. This is uh, Fanon addressing his readers. The European game has finally ended. We must find something different. If we want to turn Africa into a new Europe and America into a new Europe, then let us leave the destiny of our countries to the Europeans. They will know how to do it better than the most gifted among us. But if we want humanity to advance to a step further, if we want to bring it up to a different level than that which Europe has shown it, then we must invent 
and we must make new discoveries. For Europe, for ourselves, and for humanity, comrades, we must turn over a new leaf. We must work out new concepts and try to set afoot a new man. So as you can see here, Fanon and Sankara are saying something very different. So you can read the speeches of Sankara, and you can get the, you know, how he plans to implement this Fanonist ideas. But if you read The Wretched of the Earth, you'll get it in a more uh, th uh, theoretical uh, overview of these same ideas. So here, here's an image of Kant and Hegel. These are two of the figures that are associated with the development of European humanism, the idea of the historical human subject. You know, Hegel was terrible racist, uh, by the way, uh, who famously said Africa has no uh, history. Uh, every African, uh, that's one of the reasons why Hegel is not so uh, well known in Africa, or I shouldn't say well known, he's well known, but he's not, uh, he's not very popular. And yet, you know, there is a sense in which Fanon and Sankara both are also influenced by Hegel in spite of his racism and his uh, ignorance. But, uh, but, but so, so Fanon and Sankara both, we could say, remain within a Kantian, Hegelian, and Marxian uh, framework. And, and even though their thought has been, in, uh, uh, you know, transformed to fit the African context, it also uh, develops within this particular historical itinerary as well. Here's Sankara. For the new man, we must have a new people, a people that has its own identity knows what it wants and how to assert itself. If the people of France would take the time to understand the new reality we are living through in Burkina Faso as a new reality that is largely shared in many other African countries, if they take the, the time to accept the way things are, uh, many things would change. But unfortunately, they prefer, they prefer to see the case of Burkina as an accident of history, a fluke, perhaps a transitory phenomenon. No, Reality has changed in Africa, and our relations with other countries must evolve to take this into, into account. France continues to believe that the positions of Burkina Faso can be guessed at or interpreted through this or that prima donna, like for instance himself, or strongman. Uh, this means that France has not grasped the fact that Burkina Faso is a new animal, which however reflects a new reality in Africa. Yeah, and I'll give you an example of this. Like, for instance, when people when people would chant at some of his speeches, like Thomas Sankara, may he you know reign forever, be president. He, he would he would get angry and he would tell him stop. He was like, I, you know, look, I'm not the revolution. I'm just one person here, and this this kind of chant and the slogan that you're promoting is not a good slogan. The uh, the 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 but. But France, you know, continues to want to work through these, these intermediaries like, let's say, Blaise Campore or Félix Dufay bonnier to indirectly rule these, these uh, countries. Uh, but for Sankara, a new reality has taken shape. A new man has come into existence with the revolution. The Burkina Bay is that new man, new, man, new, new person, new woman. Um, okay, so theory into praxis. Here were the actual policies of Sankara that he articulates in his orientation speech. Number one, revolutionize the national army's place in the democratic and popular revolution. Uh, to be prepared to combat all internal and external enemies and to participate in the military training of the rest of the people. A mandatory military service. The new soldier must live and suffer among the people to which he belongs. The days are gone when the army was declared neutral and apolitical while in fact serving as a bastion of reaction and a guardian of imperial interests. The people's national army will have no place for a soldier who despises, looks down on, and brutalizes the people. Okay, so the soldier has to be, in this sense, also politicized. The soldier, is the, the army is not neutral. It's The army is there to serve the interests of the revolution, which is to say the interests of the people and is, is not some kind of inert, uh, apolitical uh, entity. Number two, revolutionize Voltanic woman's role. By changing the social order that oppresses women, the revolution creates the conditions for their genuine emancipation. The women and men of our society are all victims of imperialist oppression and domination. That is why they wage the same struggle. The revolution and women's liberation go together. 
The final goal of this great undertaking is to build a free and prosperous society in which women will be equal to men in all domains. Okay, in the next lecture, we'll look a little bit in more detail at his views about women's role in the revolution. But I want to note here that it's, he places this front and center of his revolutionary praxis, this question of the transformation and liberation of, of women's roles in society. Number three, revolutionize the economy at the service of a democratic and popular uh, society. So for, for Sankara, this includes agrarian reform, administrative reform, educational reform, reform of the structures of production and distribution, making health care affordable to everyone, initiating maternal and infant care and assistance, launching an immunization policy, education and hygiene, establishing uh, re reasonable rents, construction of modern residential housing on a massive scale, and to com uh, combat prejudices among different ethnic groups. Very uh, ambitious uh, program indeed, and, and one that is certainly quite progressive, even I mean, uh, in, by today's standards. Uh, these are the same things that people are fighting for right here in the United States. Um, now, Sankara, uh, this is just one instance of this. He was very famous for, uh, instead of, you know, he, he, he had government officials wear peasant smocks. He drove this very modest car. He would ride his bicycle. To, uh, to his office, and he, he did not allow any government officials to ride in fancy cars or live in fancy houses. Again, think, think of that uh, Gramscian idea of the organic intellectual. Uh, Sankara was for, was for truly transforming his society. He wanted the leaders of the government to be uh, close in values to the people and certainly not use their positions to uh, enrich themselves, put money in their own pocket. As opposed to, say, you can see Blaise Campori, the man who killed Norbert Zongo and the man who killed uh, Thomas Sankara, he had a zoo, he put up a zoo, he drove in fancy cars. Uh, on the images on the far uh, right at the top and the bottom, this was the, the after uh, Campori was, uh, was finally driven out of this of Burkina Faso after many years of oppressive rule. This was the house of his brother, Francois Capoy, who was, who was probably the main figure behind the assassination of Norbert Zongo. If it wasn't, if he wasn't act, acting on it, it's hard to imagine him doing that without uh, Campoy's permission. Uh, you know, people called Francois Campoy, they called him Le Petit President or the, the Little president. Uh, but here they are looting his house after he after the Campores were finally driven out of, of the country. And there are other images you see are from uh, Blaze's uh, zoo. Well, we know, unfortunately, Campore uh, did succeed in, in leading a coup against Thomas Sankara and assassinating him, and uh, which then led to the reversal of many of these policies that Sankara had instituted, Burkina Faso returned to being a kind of a vassal state of France and uh, the, the conditions of poverty continued and, and many of the messes that are there in Burkina today are the responsibility of this despot Blaise Compore who, who killed a lot of people really, he was a very brutal uh, dictator. Uh, but this that ends this lecture. In the next lecture, we're gonna look at some other speeches by uh, Sankara uh, as well.